All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 41. We got some JavaScript news today, and um, yeah, let's just. Um, <laughs> I would actually call today's episode uh, React or maybe even Dan Abramov podcast because we have quite a lot of articles from him. So he started his new blog and um, this is exactly what we're gonna start with. So the first three articles we've got here today are from uh, Dan Abramov uh, from his overreacted blog and all of them are as you might imagine, related to the React.js. Uh, hey Bakal, welcome to the stream. Nice Saturday to you as well. Right, so the first article we got here is called My Wishlist for Hot Reloading. And this is sort of a recap of the Hot Reloading project, which is uh, exactly what the Dan Abramov brought to us, right? So this was the original idea behind the whole like Redux, what started the Redux actually, and what started the whole um, React hype, I guess. I mean, partially, right? And he's sort of looking back at the whole Hot Reloading process and implementation and why is it complicated and how it could actually be better and he also talks about you know that reloading functions is actually like let me try that again reloading functions is miles easier than reloading classes because you don't actually have to patch class and then you know replace the methods within a class you can just swap a function implementation right and because it doesn't have any state or anything like this so uh, he talks that, okay, React is now switching to functions. So it's actually going to be way easier to do hot reloading with uh, new hooks and new functional components, right? So he goes around to say, okay, here's my wish list for the next React hot reloading um, component or tool, I guess. I'm, I'm not even sure. Is it a library? I guess it's considered a dev tool, right? And he lists a bunch of points that he wants to see in the new React Hot Reloader. Uh, the interesting thing is that there was another discussion on Twitter going on about this post that said that um, out of, I think there's like 70 or 20 points here and more than half of them is already implemented, which is kind of incredible. So I'm, I, I just keep being amazed by the uh, productivity of this guy, like he's really good. <laughs> So if you're interested in hot reloading uh, the React components and in what kind of things are essentially awaiting us in the near future, do check this article out. You will get a pretty good idea of what is coming to your React hot reloader quite soon. Next article we got here from, again, from Dan Abramov is called How Does Set State Knows What To Do? And this is uh, another deep dive into the React inner workings. Um, there's a pretty neat disclaimer in the beginning of the article that says, just like most other posts on this blog, you don't actually need to know any of this to be productive with React. This post is for those who like to see what's behind the curtain, completely optional. So, you know, if you just want to work with React and you don't care about inner workings, then you might as well ignore this post. But if you have, <clears throat> if you have any slight interest in how does React works under the hood, this post is amazing. So it talks about exactly set state, right? And it explains not just the set state. Blah, blah, blah. God, I, why is it speaking so hard today? Okay, let's try this again. So it not only talks about the set state itself, but it also talks about how does React and React DOM, React DOM server, React native, React test render, and a bunch of other renderers work together, right? Because uh, all that set state actually does, it tells the engine, hey, you actually should update the render, right? Because this is not the part of react package. So it is a fascinating read. And there's a lot of information that I didn't honestly didn't even think about, right? So I knew that there was some sort of a reconciler. And I always thought it was a part of react package, which turns out it's not which makes total sense when you read that. But it is really interesting. So once again, if you have even slightest interest in uh, react inner workings, and you want to know how exactly set state triggers the re render and how the re render happens, absolutely recommended read it is really cool. It's not very long, uh, but very detailed and uh, very interesting, like beyond interesting, I would say it was like absolutely fascinating. Cool. Uh, next article we got here is also from Dan Abramov. As I said, today is Dan Abramov podcast. And uh, this one is called Why do React hooks rely on call order? And it talks about the hooks proposal. 
uh, since it was already accepted, so it's not actually gonna, you know, talk about the details or whatever, there's been enough of those posts. This one actually goes uh, to argue um, about the suggested alternatives to hooks, right? So we had a lot of them, uh, we, we saw a lot of them even on this podcast. There's a lot of people suggesting alternative designs to hooks, specifically to address points like, hey, hooks are actually uh, depend on the order of execution, right? So as, as soon as you swap those use states um, in places, those would be different on the next render, right? So this will be essentially break things. So you have to call them in a specific order. And this is one of the sort of caveats that Hook has, and a lot of people were very unhappy about that, right? So Dan goes to say, that, okay, we actually, there's a, there's a larger response to the Hook API design from uh, Sebastian here, if you're interested actually. And they've seen like a dozen or probably even hundreds different alternative proposals to Hooks they were saying, okay, we can solve this and we can solve this and we can solve it this way and that way. And he goes to address the most common flaws that actually those alternative proposals have. Um, and the most interesting thing is that majority of those proposals um, did not allow extracting a custom hooks, right? So I, I thought that was sort of the most important thing about the hooks, not just the fact that they allow you to very neatly set state or to very neatly, you know, uh, use effects or whatever, not use classes, do functional, uh, functional components. But I actually saw that the most important and the coolest feature was the fact that you could create a custom hook, right, that would then be reusable in multiple components, which is, in my opinion, just game changing, essentially, right. And turns out that a lot of those alternative proposals didn't actually allow you to extract a custom hooks because of the different limitations. Um, the other things is that like, hey, people suggested using uh, names for hooks so that you know, it, we don't depend on the order of execution anymore, but we actually depend on the name, which when you first think about it, it kind of makes sense. You thought, okay, you know, we can use a name and then it doesn't matter where you call it, it's still going to be tied to that specific name. But the name clashes are a thing, right? So if you have a large React code base, uh, sooner or later, someone is gonna change something and magic strings is never a good thing, right? And it's exactly, there's a bit more detailed explanation here on why this is exactly bad, but uh, do make sure to read through that. Uh, and then it goes to, you know, the problem of Kent calling the same hook twice. Again, this is goes to the extraction logic. So once you extract something into a custom hook, you want to call it multiple times, right? This is how it works in 99% of cases, I guess. But uh, some of those proposals actually disallowed doing that or broke when you try to do that, which is, yeah, not perfect. There is a lot of very interesting problems there. And when you first, so uh, like when you first see this alternative proposals, you go like, oh, that actually looks interesting. You know, it might be, why didn't they implement it like this? But then I start reading a post like this from Dan and you go like, oh, I see actually there's like 200 issues that are very tricky to actually tackle and the current design of hooks might be actually the best one. And I, I guess this is why they went with it, right? Even though it has the downsides and there's like some specific problems that are still can be solved by things like linters. They are not perfect and they are not claiming it's perfect, but it actually addresses all those concerns and makes it makes it work, which is kind of great. So yeah, if you have any interest in hooks and um, wonder why the proposal that why they didn't change the proposal in the end, do check this article out. It's really cool. All right, next article we got here is object oriented programming and RxJS managing state in React with Akita. This is an introduction, uh, introduction to Akita, which is the state management library built on top of RxJS and uh, object oriented model, right? So it's an object oriented design principles, which is to me sounds a bit weird because you know, I always thought RxJS itself was sort of very functional, right? They, they also have the pipeline operator and or like they use the pipe operator right now, pipe function which is later going to be switched into pipeline operator, which is inherently sort of functional programming thing. But uh, yeah, someone decided that they wanted an object oriented uh, pattern based functional store, or I guess RxJS store. 
which, I mean, I guess it works. It actually looks quite nice. So it's written in TypeScript and the store itself looks pretty neat. There's a bunch of very interesting features and um, possible things that you would wanna do, but it's all very object oriented. So I am not a fan of this. So I just skim through the article, even though, you know, the code looks quite neat. I have to give it that. I probably would not use that because I just dislike the classes and all the related shenanigans that they bring along with them. But maybe you do like object-oriented programming and you wanted to have something like this in your React app. Uh, maybe you also like RxJS and wanted to combine those two. So check this one out. Seems to be pretty good. Uh, maybe this is what you were looking for. Next article we got here is rebuilding Redux with hooks and context. Um, state manage. Okay, let me just have a quick look in the, in the chat. State management with op looks weird. Was thought op brings a lot of problems with the state. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of like the object oriented programming itself does not bring the problems with the state as they typically the people who try to build those extremely long and complicated um, hierarchies. You know, you like you have base class and you have the class that expands the base class and you have the class that expands this class then the class that extends this one then there's like 25 interfaces and and then you just spend two hours trying to map the whole thing in your mind i mean the uml exists for a reason right because at some point it just became really hard to actually keep all of that in the head which is why they build the uml which actually visualizes the whole thing for you but uh I think that's exactly the problem. It's like, it's too hard to keep that in mind. And if it's too hard to keep that in mind, it's probably gonna be pain in ass to actually think about that. So this is kind of my take on object-oriented programming. I'm not saying it's completely bad and using classes and uh, object-oriented programming in a limited way can actually be very helpful. Like for example, React is a good example, right? So they literally have only one or two compo like classes that you can extend and it works perfectly fine because they don't have that huge intertwined structure that is really hard to reason about. But again, back to the articles. Uh, next one we got here is rebuilding Redux with hooks and context. And it talks about recreating Redux exactly with hooks and context, right? So it is pretty straightforward. So there's nothing extremely complex about it, but it once again demonstrates the power of hooks and custom hooks, which is, Kind of incredible. So using the hooks, you can now rebuild the Redux in about three, 400 lines, I guess, if you would just take, you know, take a look at the whole code. And it's very easy. I mean, primarily because the React hooks have the use reducer uh, hook, right? Which essentially replaces like half of Redux basically. <laughs> But um, yeah, if you are curious as how to, you can rebuild the Redux um, using React hooks, this is a pretty nice little exercise. And um, I'm to be honest, I am quite excited to see what kind of state management solutions we're gonna um, see once the hooks are released. And maybe there's even gonna be like official one from the React team, you know, because Redux is gonna evolve somehow to address the hooks. So we are gonna see what this is gonna happen. But meanwhile, this one's pretty cool. So do check it out. All right. Next article we got here is JavaScript inheritance and the prototype chain. This is a pretty deep dive into the whole OOP side of the JavaScript. And uh, it does not talk about, I don't, I don't think it actually talks about classes. I don't remember seeing them here. No, it does talk about classes in the end. Okay. But it basically starts talking about the ES5 prototypes, functions, and prototypical inheritance that is the base of JavaScript, right? So the base of JavaScript OOP. So if you already know how the classes work, if you already know how the prototypes work, you won't really find anything new here. It's very basic, but it is very in depth. So if you are still, you know, trying to get to terms with it, if you're still trying to grasp how the classes work, how do they relate to prototypes, then this article will explain basically everything you have to know. Um, if you already know about classes, if you already understand the prototypical inheritance chain, then there's nothing really eye-opening in here. It's just a really good write-up and explainer of all of that stuff. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have to say about that. There's nothing, um, yeah, it's just really, really good tutorial on prototypical inheritance and uh, how do classes relate to that essentially. All right. Next article we got here is a sync react using react rotor and suspense. 
This is another tutorial talking about the React Suspense and Lazy uh, Function Helper that has been introduced in the React 16.6 .6 that allow you to dynamically load components, right? Um, and in this case, it's not just a basic tutorial as we've seen like, I think four or five of them already. This one actually does it in a context of using React Router, which is, uh, I think can be helpful for a lot of people because it might be a bit tricky to understand how do you make Suspense work with the React Router specifically. Although React Router is actually just components. So in theory, that's uh, quite easy, right? So if you've been wanting to do a root splitting and to load your pages separately, but wasn't sure how exactly you do that with the new React Suspense and the lazy helper, now you can just look at this article and it will basically guide you through the setup of a um, simple page that has a bunch of roots that are loaded with a suspense. And yeah, it's relatively straightforward. I don't really have much more to say about that. It's probably will take about 10 minutes to understand it. It's great article and explains it very easily. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. This probably has everything you ever wanted to know. All right. Next article we got here is another one from uh, Max Koretsky, uh, and it is another one of the in-depth sort of deep dives into internals of React Fiber, which were uh, the previous one were absolutely amazing. So if you haven't seen him, do check him out. Uh, this article is in-depth explanation of state and props update in React. Um, hey, Haptic, welcome to the stream. So this article talks uh, specifically about how does React Fiber, so because we're talking about the React internals, right? Uh, how does React Fiber handles the state and props updates, which is turns out quite a complicated process. Uh, hey, Infamed, welcome to the stream. Uh, right, so yeah, you would, you know, when you use React, it's very easy to just say, hey, here's the set state, here's the handle props updates, and then the React does some magic for you and all just, you know, all of that just works magically. but. If you ever wanted to know what exactly happens underneath it, right? Because we already seen the Dan's article um, in the beginning that talked about set state specifically. This one goes a bit further and talks about the props as well and the update queues and the fiber nodes and all the nitty gritty of the React fiber that you would probably never need to know unless you are very interested in what is exactly happening uh, including, by the way, the uh, component lifecycle methods, which is also pretty cool uh, and pretty interesting to see how exactly they work within this whole sort of update chain. Uh, so yes, if you wanted to gain a deeper understanding of React Fiber and React component update cycles, do check this one out. It is really great. I mean, I, I think, you know, basically this is like his fourth article, I think. So... Whenever you see this guy publishing article, just go and read it. It's gonna be good in like, I mean, so far it's been 100% of times. <laughs> so yes, uh, if you're interested in React internals, do check it out, it's really great. Right, continuing, we got uh, zero config JavaScript app prototyping with Parcel.js. Um, this is essentially a tutorial for Parcel.js. So if you never tried Parcel.js, if you are using Webpack or any other bundler really, and you wanted to try Parcel.js, uh, which is zero config bundler, which is absolutely amazing if you never used it. This article will get you started in about five minutes. It is really like pretty simply explained and the Parcel is an amazing tool and you should try it if you haven't because it will save you a lot of time. So yeah, if you wanna try Parcel, do check it out. If you already used Parcel, there is nothing really incredible in this article. So it's just, you know, basic introduction thing. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have to say about that. All right, next article we got here is how to visually design state in JavaScript, a roadmap for developing applications with state machines and state charts. So this article talks is essentially a sort of uh, thought train that le led to development of a state X library that we'll talk about in the libraries and demos section uh, that essentially uses finite state machines for state management, which is not a new idea, but you know, there's been a bunch of those, but this one has an um, additional, this, first of all, there's an interesting approach. Um, the author talks about state on example of using a Walkman, right? So it's a relatively simple gadget and you have like a bunch of states that can, you can switch between. 
So how do you implement that in React? There's the basic uh, implementation for React here. And then there's a sort of discussion of the problems related to the state switching and how those state, state machines can actually help you um, with that problem, right? And in the end, he introduces this uh, library that is called, I believe, state X, if I remember correctly. Wait, let me find it. Uh, come on, X state, okay, the other way around. And the cool thing about it is not just allows you to build the finite state machines to handle your state, right? But it also allows you to visualize your states uh, using charts, which is kind of neat. So essentially, once you build a sort of state machine, there's a special tool to generate the chart to be able to see how's your state looking and how is the switching going to happen, which is kind of awesome. So we're going to have a look at it in the libraries and demo section. But uh, if the whole journey sounds interesting, or maybe you haven't heard about state machines and or maybe you haven't thought about applying state machines to State management, uh, do check this out. It is kind of neat. All right, next article we got here is from the Netflix tech blog and it's called Our Learnings from Adopting GraphQL. So it's a very cool um, overview of the GraphQL application within the Netflix. And you know, since Netflix is very big and they provide a lot of functionality to the users, you can imagine that they have a very complicated backend system. They are running microservices and um, they essentially, they wrapped their existing REST endpoints into GraphQL. And that's a sort of an overview of what went right and what is not exactly good uh, within, you know, wh when using GraphQL. Uh, it was very interesting to see that the redistribution of load and payload optimization. Um, wait a second. No, that was not the thing that was... Uh, benefit, no, wait, was it the way? Uh, so the idea is that basically, you know, I always viewed um, using GraphQL over existing infrastructure to be sort of a um, weird thing because essentially you do not decrease the number of requests, you sort of maintain them more or less the same, right? But here's an interesting insight from the uh, Netflix guys. The idea is that instead of, uh, so the client only requests the the results from the GraphQL server, right? Which means that the GraphQL server then have to ask the same REST APIs. You would think that this would actually add some overhead, but according to the Netflix blog, it actually reduces the request times because uh, the GraphQL server and the REST APIs are in the same internal network and the requests are actually way faster and way uh, more efficient, right? Because it's an intranet now, so you don't actually care about the speed and size and everything, or not care as much as you did before, which I found to be actually interesting. So I always thought it would be the other way around, but turns out it's actually um, pretty cool. So there are more interesting thoughts in here. So if you are evaluating on using uh, GraphQL, then do check out this article from uh, Netflix, which is has some very interesting points on both advantages and disadvantages of using GraphQL uh, um, above your existing uh, REST APIs actually, which is also quite interesting use case. So instead of rebuilding the whole system, they just uh, use the GraphQL as a proxy sort of between them, you know. Yeah, really cool. So would love to see more articles like this. All right, continuing, we got lenses, the what and how. Uh, this is an introduction to lenses as in the functional programming concept that are the directly composable accessors. And um, essentially it guides you through, um, first of all, explaining what lenses are and then walking you through building your own lenses. There is a lot of functional uh, programming related things. And if you are uncomfortable with, uh, you know, functional programming notations, uh, you might be a bit lost in here. So it might take a bit longer to do this. Uh, the links can be found in the description to the channel. There is a repository called, called BXGS Weekly and all the links from all the podcasts are there. So feel free to find them there. All right. But yeah, if you are interested in functional programming, I would recommend looking at this article because the concept of lenses is pretty neat one and it allows you to do some very neat things uh, like Ramda, for example, has uh, integrated lenses, uh, if I remember correctly. So yeah, if you ever wanted to build your own lenses uh, to understand them better, do check this article out. It essentially guides you, you know, step by step 
through all of this uh, process of how you start by just accessing a specific property to converting this simple accessor into a lens that you can reuse and compose with other functions. All right. Next article we got here is how to build a blazing fast REST APIs with Node.js, MongoDB, Fastify, and Swagger. This is a pretty much basic tutorial on building a REST API with uh, Fastify, Mongoose, and Swagger. Then nothing super complicated here, but if you wanted an introduction to, for example, Fastify, which is, uh, by the way, absolutely awesome web framework that is, I think I'm using it, well, 99% of times instead of Express right now. Um, yeah, and then, you know, addition to the Fastify Swagger, which essentially automatically generates the documentation for you and uh, wrapping all of that with the MongoDB database and then testing it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's relatively straightforward. So if you build REST API and you're familiar with Fastify, you won't find anything new here or, you know, familiar with Swagger as well. I mean, Swagger is a quite nice tool. But if you never heard about one of those tools, this article does a pretty decent job at uh, introduction to all of them and showing how you can use them to build a pretty good REST API. Yeah. All right. Next uh, thing we got here, I think we are now in the territory, yes, of the tips, tricks, and bit sized awesomeness. And the first thing we got here is the write up uh, on the um, CSS in JavaScript and why is. CSS and JS more maintainable than the just JavaScript. It's a very, very holy worry topic. And um, there's been a ton of discussion about it. And I think this is probably one of the most convincing write ups I've seen on the topic. So it is from the um, uh, Sunil Pai, uh, the guy who builds, oh God, I, I really forgot what he built. I'm a terrible uh, person. Yeah, Glamour, right. So he was building the Glamour, or is building actually the Glamour, the uh, inline CSS for React solution, which is quite popular, right? And so essentially he's been working with CSS and JS for a long time, and I just closed the wrong tab. Uh, and he, I think he gets into pretty much every argument about CSS and JS out there. <laughs> So if you're curious as to why CSS and JS is actually better than plain CSS, do read this out. There is also some interesting discussion going on in the comments. Make sure to read those as well. But I personally find this to be very, very convincing. So if you are still unconvinced, um, do check it out. I think this is a very good, some very good points. And the more I've been working with the more complex applications, the more I kind of get to the more or less the same conclusions. I mean, I guess it took longer for me because I'm not exactly the front end guy and I'm not interacting with CSS that much. I mean, majority of my interactions come down to using Bulma. But then when you start to try to optimize it for size, you notice that, you know, instead of like you import the whole Bulma, but you actually use like 5% of it maybe. And then you start wondering if, if that could have been made better. And I think the CSS and JS kind of solves that. So um, if you're curious in the topic, do check it out. It's quite cool. Next thing we got here is the details about the event stream incident from the NPM blog. This is the official write up from the NPM guys on the event stream related uh, problem or incident as they say it, right? So if you are still, uh, if you want a good summary from the NPM guys, and if you want to know exactly what happened, if you're still not sure, if you missed the previous podcast and previous 225 articles, <laughs> do check this one out. It uh, summarizes everything quite nicely. Next thing we got here is transferable streams that are now shipped in Chrome Canary that I think is a really cool feature. So again, this is just in Chrome Canary and behind the flag for now. But um, this is a feature that allows you to send a stream from the, po uh, from the worker to the main thread and then uh, to read that stream in the client, right? So this is at least my understanding of it. So you can uh, actually, as in, okay, it's not just the readable stream, so you can use it any stream for that, obviously. But the idea is that you can pass the stream between the worker and uh, main thread using the post message, right? So before that, that wasn't actually possible. You could only send around the objects, which are non-interactable as you might imagine. I am kind of curious as to what you could do with that. So we're, we're gonna see how that ends up. I, I guess there's gonna be shipped in the stable version in, 
three, four days. Uh, sorry, three, four days. <laughs> Not three, four days, three, four months. So the release cycle is like a couple of months for major, right? So it's like three, four major versions, maybe even longer. Yeah, so maybe mid next year. We got my curious to see. Anyway, it's really cool. Essentially, you can just pass around the stream from the worker and then worker does the job. It just sends the data, for example, into the stream and then the stream is gonna be read in the clients, in the main thread, right? And then rendered in React, for example, which is a really neat use case, for example. So I'm quite excited about that. Next thing we got here is the uh, Code Sandbox app is just you know, getting better and better. They just added the private environmental variables uh, for the containerized apps that you can just uh, use in your sandbox. And then whenever someone runs it, it will actually work as expected. And if someone forks it, or you know, I don't remember how exactly it's called the, um, what's the button? Is it like copy fork or whatever? Yes, it is fork button. Okay, so when someone forks the app, they won't actually, um have access to your environmental variable and they would have to set it themselves which is very neat and uh, really awesome for demos right next thing we got here is the new rfc in npm uh world it's called uh, singleton packages rfc and the idea is that a package should be able to specify that it wants to be a singleton as in there should be only one instance of this package installed when you run npm install this is incredibly useful for web components, for things like React, for linters, for a two billion of different other tools that currently are like majority of them are actually solved by using peer dependencies, right? You just say, hey, React should be a peer dependency and then whoever uses this package installs it as a peer dependency. Actually having it as a singleton might uh, fix that. So we are we're gonna see how all of that ends up. It's an interesting proposal to say the least. All right. Next thing we got here is the announcement from the V8 team. So V8 uh, version 7.2 in Chrome 72 have public class fields shipped. So you actually can now use the syntax with the equals as in the property equals something on the class without Babel or anything uh, like this. Um, yes, Code Sandbox is fantastic. So this is literally my current sandbox of the pick. You can do Node there, you can do front end, you can do pretty much anything you want. And it literally runs VS Code in your browser. So you can't really ask for more than that. You know, it's, it's awesome. If you haven't tried it, do give it a shot. It's amazing. All right, uh, continuing, we got an, a tiny article called Unit Testing Amazon Web Services Lambda Function in Node.js. So uh, as you might imagine, unit testing Lambda functions is actually not that hard because they are tiny and there is, I mean, there's nothing really special about that, right? You just import the function and you call it. The problem comes when you try to um, interact with the Amazon Web Services SDK. For example, you maybe you have the DynamoDB access, right? So what's gonna happen when you test it? Well, obviously it's gonna fail because you don't really have access to Amazon Web Services environment. This post talks about mocking those um, things like DynamoDB and the other Amazon Web Services dependencies using Xenon, which can be extremely helpful when testing this locally. So if you were curious how you could do that or if you were confused about that, uh, do check it out. This is a pretty good introduction. Next article we got here is a crash course on serverless with Amazon Web Services running Node.js 11 on Lambda. So if, you, uh, if you're not tracking Amazon Web Services Lambda uh, or you know the whole serverless thing, uh, functional deployments and everything, uh, you might not know that it actually was limited to a specific versions of nodes uh, up to uh, recently, like I think two weeks ago, they announced the change. So when, whenever you deployed a function, it will be deployed in a very specific version of Node.js and uh, which version of Node.js was controlled by the Amazon themselves, right? So you actually have to wait for the Amazon to update the node if you wanted to use the latest version, for example. Recently, they introduced custom runtimes and layers for Lambda. What that means is that you can actually build your custom runtime which could be, for example, latest node version. And this tutorial exactly guides you through doing this how do you build your own custom runtime and how do you deploy your functions using Node.js 11, which is, you know, 11.4 in this case, which is the latest Node.js version. 
So if you're using um, Amazon Web Services Lambda and if you were curious about custom runtimes and wanted to deploy your functions in using the latest node, you can now do this using this tiny tutorial. It is pretty neat. All right. Now we are coming to the releases section and the first release of this week is the Firefox 64 with a bunch of new things like multi-tab selection, DevTools improvements, new CSS features, new JavaScript, uh, like I guess it's not exactly new features, more like tiny improvements. Uh, full screen API is now finally unprefixed and we got WebVR 1.1 in macOS working, which was uh, quite overdue, I think. Um, yeah, so... I mean, Firefox keeps getting better. I I still kind of using Chrome too much. Uh, I think I'm 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 tied to V8 a bit. I I like V8 a bit too much. Let's put it this way. But um, it's quite exciting to see Firefox developing. I mean, I'm I'm wondering if at some point they will overtake Chrome in the market share. Also, it doesn't really seem like this. But uh, yeah, we're gonna see how that develops. All right, next release we got is Visual Studio Code version 1.30 November release with as usual, a ton of features, releases, fixes, and changes. My favorite one being the JS doc markdown highlighting, but there is, yeah, there's like a, as usual, a ton of things that they've added, changed and improved. So still, you know, as, as you might or might not know, VS Code is still my favorite uh, IDE for editing JavaScript. And with the IntelliCode extension that they've added is even better. So it's, it's amazing, check it out. Right, next thing we got here is React Spring version seven release. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, they, they released a stable version with hooks. <laughs> so I guess this is the first library that I've seen released stable version with hooks that are still in alpha. Um, is there a Node.js backend with SpiderMonkey? Yes, there is actually a Node.js versions with all the uh, backends. So there's, you, can, you get one with SpiderMonkey, you get one with Chakra Core, and there was one with, uh, what's the other engine? The, um, the Safari one, I forgot the name of it. Oh God, um, whatever. So they, they, are, they exist and I think they even in an, in an official WebKit, right? No, WebKit is not the, uh, uh, it's not the JavaScript engine, right? WebKit is the rendering engine. Um, wait a second. There was, let, let, <laughs> now I need to remember that. Yes, exactly. WebKit is a renderer. Um, da, 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 da. So there's the Node Chakra Core. There is Node V8. There is, I think we should filter it by nodes. Come on, nodes. Uh, node, do, 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 Docker nodes, that is not it. Node stream, HTTP, node, 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 JSKO. So node chakra, node spider, node V8. And oh man, what was the, wait a second. God damn it, Safari uh, JS engine. What was the name of it? JavaScript engine, uh, Nitro. It might be Nitro, but hell if I remember. Da, 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 JavaScript engines, Reno, Spider Monkey, V8, JavaScript Core. JavaScript Core, this is what it's called. God damn it, how could I forget that? Yes, GSC. Right, so there is, um, there is actually the Node versions with all the other engines are hosted on the official Node.js group. So you can find them here. There's the Chakra Core one, there's the V8 one, there's the Spider Monkey one, there's the GSC one. And you can just take them and use them. And I think NVM also allows you to install those versions uh, separately if you're interested. So, okay. But yeah, coming back, we got the React Spring version seven. And I think it's the first library on my memory that is shipped with the hook support as a stable version. So you can literally use it with hooks. And can I just say that the animations with hooks look freaking amazing. It literally takes four lines of code to set up a really awesome animations with it. And it just looks, the code looks super easy to read. So if you were looking to do some React animations, take a look at React Spring. It is quite good and now supports hooks. Right, next release we got here is, uh, yes, Exoframe, uh, shameless shill. This is a package I maintain and it allows you to do single command deployments. And I just added, uh, it's uh, version 3.3 .3, and I just added hooks, uh, sorry, secret support. Um, it, no, it doesn't have hooks, hooks support yet, but uh, you can now deploy your um, things from GitHub and you can now commit your configs 
without being afraid to know add some secret information to it because you can now store secrets on the server which makes it uh, quite much easier all right next release we got here is bootstrap 3.4.0 so this is the uh, maintenance release for the old version of bootstrap that addresses some uh, security issues as well as some build tooling updates and stuff like this. So if you are still using Bootstrap 3, make sure to update because it does resolve an XSS issue and you don't wanna have it in your Bootstrap. So yes. All right, next release we got here is Billboard JS version 1.7.0, which is a pretty nice, um, God damn it, charting library is what I wanna say. So if you've never seen it, try it out. It is quite easy to use. If you have seen it, well, there's a new version with a bunch of improvements, new themes, um, and a bunch of bug fixes as usual. So it also seems to have added TypeScript support, which is nice for all the TypeScript faults. Uh, so yeah, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Ember 3.6 release. I am not an Ember guy, so I have no idea what exactly is this about. I think the primary change is that they are now switching to native classes, so you actually can use ES6 classes in it. Don't know anything about Ember, uh, to be honest, so can't really comment, but if you're using Ember, uh, do check it out, I guess. All right, and the last release of the week we got here today is Node.js version 10.14.2 LTS. So this is the uh, yeah maintenance release for the LTS, uh, which basically upgrades some dependencies and uh, fixes a crash in Windows. And that's basically it. And uh, that is it for releases. Uh, League of Legends client, you, I mean, there's a lot of uh, websites using Ember actually. I mean, it's relatively popular, especially among the Ruby folks, if I remember correctly. I just never used it for some reason. So, you know, can't really comment on that. I think it's a quite good framework, uh, but, Never mind. Let's get to the libraries and demos section. The first library we got today is Fuse.js, lightweight fuzzy search library with zero dependencies. Um, the demo is very bare bones, but it works pretty well. So like you have this array of items, right? And then you can use uh, fuzzy search that actually works pretty well. So if I search for, uh, something like Mnver, right? So it actually finds old man's war, which is really good. So if you are looking for a lightweight fuzzy search library for your client sites, do check this one out. Next library we got is Voca.js. This is a ultimate Java string string library. Did I just say Java string? JavaScript string library. And it basically has uh, methods uh, for working with strings. There's uh, basically everything you can imagine from camel case, lower case, kebab case, to chaining, to chopping the string in parts, to counting, to escaping and unescaping, to formatting, to pad left, pad right. Basically whatever you can imagine working with strings, it is probably here. Um, if you're using Lodash, you might not need that because Lodash has some of those things. But if you are need specifically to work with the strings, do check it out. It seems to have pretty much everything you want. And also works in Internet Explorer 9, which is always a nice addition. All right, next thing we got here is Terminus, a terminal for modern age. This is another terminal emulator built in uh, using Electron. And um, it actually works quite well with uh, Bash and Windows, so VSL thing. This was one of the reasons I uh, picked it up to try it out. I mean, it's still um, not as good as, for example, Terminator. And even if you run X server and yeah, if you're using, um, I, I, sorry, not iOS, macOS, iTerm2 is still, I think the best. Um, yeah, on OS X, it is still, um, I, I'm still using um, iTerm2. Like, I think those, Terminal have potential. They are not slow. They are relatively well developed, but it's for whatever reason, I always end up encountering some weird bugs in them that just, you know, like for example, in my Mac OS, I have my Mac, uh, Mac MacBook, right? As a dev machine and it's turned on for forever, essentially. I never turn it off. I just shut down the lead. It goes into sleep. Then I open it. My uptime is like hundred something days right now. So whatever the last update was. I think it's like 90, more like 100 days, but whatever. And uh, iTerm works perfectly fine. So I close the lead, I open the lead and it still works. Um, Hyper and this one, Terminus, 
I close the lead, I open the lead and there's no window. Or I close the lead, I open the lead and it stops being responsive. I don't know like if that's a problem of the electron, if that's a problem of the terminal itself, it's just not a very good developer experience. So I, for now, I will stick with my um, iTerm and with my Terminator on Windows, which, you know, even though I am using X on Windows, as in the X system from Linux on Windows and running the Terminator through VSL through X, it works better than this, which I mean, I guess partially a bit sad, but on the other hand, Terminator has a long, had a long time to uh, develop a very good and stable terminal. So, but yeah, anyway, it's a really nice project. So do check it out if you're interested. Next thing we got here is a green sock. This is a library that uh, is basically, yeah, high performance, professional grade animations for modern web. And it's a very nice animation library that, um, you can basically animate just about anything you want with it. Where is my documentation? There we go. Has twinning, has curves, has whatever the hell you can imagine. It's really good. And the interesting thing is that I remember using the green sock in, uh, I think it was like either in the beginning of 2000s or in the end of 90s where I was using Flash and ActionScript 3. I was like, is that the same green sock? And turns out, yes, it is. They still have the old Flash version over here, so you can actually use the action script one, which is kind of incredible. They still maintain that. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. It's a pretty good uh, animation library, actually. All right, next thing we got here is Under Game, a simple game with procedural graphics in JavaScript and GLSL. So it uses shaders and uh, procedural generations of level. It's a, like the game itself is relatively simple. It's like Flappy Bird, essentially, or Flappy Snake, I guess, in this case, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty neat project and uh, very well written. So do check it out if you're interested in using GLSL and JavaScript. Varc.com is an example of GSAP, one of my favorite ones. Let's check it out. Ooh, that is, okay, that is some slick animations. All right, yeah, that is some very slick animations. Okay, that is very impressive. Thank you for sharing, that's really cool. Okay, uh, but yeah, so it was under game. Check it out if you want it. Uh, there is a next thing is two up the component for comparing two DOM elements using a slider between them. I don't think there's a demo somewhere. Yeah, so there's no demo, but you know, on the websites, you typically see like two images, for example, and you can drag a slider between them to check them out the difference. So this does the same, but with two different DOM elements, which is kind of awesome. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It is uh, from the Google Chrome Labs team. So um, yeah, it's quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is XState. This is the library we were talking about in the beginning. It's the state machines and state charts for modern web. So state management with state machines. And it also has this super nice visualizer that is actually interactive and you can actually do it right here. Why is it so tiny? Yeah, so um, it's it's kind of, kind of awesome. Um, Check it. I mean, yeah, if you know, if you're into state machines, do check it out. It seems to be really cool. Next thing we got here is Arara Arare. I'm not sure how to read that correctly. I'm guessing this is a word from the language I just don't know, but it is a lightweight functional programming library, a little library that provides you a bunch of methods like reduce partition, uh, map, apply, map, cat, and all this kind of stuff. So, what do you expect exactly from the functional programming library? Not sure how it compares to something like Ramda, for example. Once again, you know, those new projects, uh, it looks nice. Like you can use all of those methods and you can carry them and all of that kind of stuff. But I always, once again, this I've been, I think I've been nagging about this every time I see a new library, but every time you publish a new library, please explain to me why is this better than existing library? How is it differs? What are the downsides? What are the upsides? What are the advantages, right? Uh, I mean, again, maybe you were looking for something like this. Uh, check it out. Next thing we got here is a quick link again from Google Chrome Labs team. Uh, this is a faster subsequent page loads by prefetching in viewport links during idle time. Is a really neat little library that basically uses the intersection observer and request idle callback to find a moment when the user doesn't do anything on the screen, right? And to prefetch the links that are currently on the screen so that when user decides, hey, I wanna actually click this link now, 
The link will already be preloaded and once it clicks it, it will be rendered immediately, which is very neat idea. And it's just, it's less than one kilobyte minified and gzipped and it's, 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 it's just awesome. Like, why would you not use that? It's, it's great. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is a dev hub, a tweet deck for GitHub uh, also works on mobiles, which is kind of awesome. So it's a, I think it's a progressive web app essentially. And uh, if you ever use tweet deck, you know, it's, you know, like a bunch of columns where you can track different uh, things. You can have your like notifications, specific repositories and groups. Looks nice. I don't think I've ever spent so much time on GitHub as I do on Twitter. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, but <laughs> maybe you need something like this. So do check it out. It's quite nice. All right. Next thing we got here is Rendora, dynamic server side rendering using headless Chrome to effortlessly solve SEO problems for modern JavaScript websites. I would argue that modern JavaScript websites should include server-side rendering out of the box and preferably more efficient way than just running Chrome in the backend. But if you have a legacy project that is pure JavaScript and you want to improve its SEO, then you can use this thing to essentially render it using Chrome and then send it to uh, crawlers in a pre-rendered form, right? So this is a pretty good solution for legacy software, but I would say that, you know, if you're running a modern JavaScript website, it is very much worth investing into a proper uh, server-side rendering pipeline, which would be more efficient and um, faster, I guess, than this, you know, especially if you have a dynamic website. But yeah, it's a neat project anyway. All right, next thing we got here, and the last thing we got here is actually match it a tiny quick parser and matcher for URLs that allows you to, uh, first of all, parse the pattern and then match the specific roots against the pattern. So, which is very straightforward, but you know, maybe you want that that's uh, useful for routing, for example. Uh, it is from uh, Mr. Luke Edwards, the author of Polka and a dozen of other pretty nice, tiny uh, libraries. So it's quite good Do check it out. All right, that's it for the um, primary part of the podcast. Before we wrap the whole thing up, I want to share a thing called Doom Sigil. This is a free megawatts created by Mr. John Romero, the guy who originally built Doom in 1993. Uh, and this is the VOD released for the anniversary of Doom. So if you didn't know, the Doom um, is now 25 years old, slightly more than that, like a few days more, but yeah, it is kind of amazing. And um, he released the Sigil, which is essentially a completely new game, if you would, running on the original Doom engine, which I, I have yet to try it, but I've downloaded it, prepared it, and I'm ready to play because it looks amazing. And again, it's from uh, Romero, so it's got to be good, right? <laughs> Can't wait to try that at some point, but yes. Uh, so if you have any even slight interest in in uh, old games, do check it out. It seems to be awesome. Stream it today. Well, I'm not sure we'll have time today because we are going to be moving flats, but we're going to see how that goes. So... Uh, Maybe I'll stream it at some point because it, I mean, it's like Doom was always one of the most fascinating games to me, at least, you know, I, I really love the old Dooms. I really like the latest one when they like sort of went back to the roots. I'm really waiting for the new Doom and the, like the ability to play another game built by Romero is just awesome. Like, yeah. So if you have a slight interest in games, do check it out. All right, that's actually it for BXJS Weekly episode 41. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, uh, links you wanna share, maybe something I missed, do feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, then uh, we can as well wrap it up here and go have a nice rest of the weekend and uh, do our house stuff or play video games or do nothing or read books or program something, whatever you prefer. So is there any questions? Uh, as usual, meanwhile, while people are thinking about the questions, you can find all the links mentioned on the GitHub. Uh, you can send me your links. You can join our Discord server. <gasps> right, right, wait, guys, I, have a, I actually have a huge announcement before I forget about that. 
BXJS Weekly has been accepted to the iTunes. So you can now actually listen it directly from your iTunes podcast account. And uh, it is now there in the MP3 format and the description includes all the links that you might need. So if you are preferred this way, do go listen it on iTunes, which is kind of neat. I'm not sure why the image is not here. It should be there, but I guess something broke, but whatever. Um, yeah, um, yes, happy pre Merry Christmas indeed. There is Christmas coming soon. So I've already talked about this in the Discord. But uh, the idea is that in the next weeks, I'm gonna be basically the next week, we're gonna have pretty much normal week. I'm planning to have a Christmas stream on 24th. We're gonna do some giveaways and probably play some video games and do some silly shit. I'm gonna give away some games that I have, like I have a bunch of spare games lying around. And then uh, we're probably gonna have one or two more streams during that week, big just weekly for sure. And I also wanna have a stream on 1st of January because first of all, it's new year and second of all, it's my birthday. So we're gonna again do some uh, silly stuff, play video games and I'm gonna do some more giveaways because it's my birthday. So um, yeah, that's basically the plan for the next couple of weeks. Seems like no more questions. So um, then guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, thank you very much for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Um, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.